In the winter of 1776, at Valley Forge, Tom Paine wrote, these are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Thanks, S-A-C-H-S. Ernest Attorney? Rest. Thanks, S-A-C? S-A-C-H-S. Age? 27. Military training? Uh, as a helicopter pilot. Oh, no. OCS? No. No. Uh, Marine Aviation Cadet. Marquette. Marquette. Rank? Well, the highest rank attained. Whip it on us, baby. Well, highest, rank, highest rank attained, Captain. No! <laughs> see, duty period now. August 66, September 67. Have you ever witnessed any of the following? One prisoner shot. Uh, I don't know whether I have or not. Offhand. This one might be apropos. Uh, prisoners thrown from helicopters. Yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> I've, I've never seen him thrown out of my airplane because it's behind me, but uh, we had a couple of guys <laughs> from Philadelphia in our squadron, they used to, uh, used to blindfold the guys with safety wire mm -hmm. and pull them real tight, so, so this copper wire is uh, tearing into their eyes and nose right. and, and bind their hands with safety wire. And uh, used to have contests seeing how far they could throw the bo bound bodies out of the airplane mm -hmm. and you know, throw on as far as he can and see if he can get the other one farther. Uh, <coughs> if you could approximate how many, how many instances have, have you come across this? Of that, in the two-digit numbers, say, somewhere between 15 and 50, probably. <laughs> Some of these people weren't necessarily either uh, Kong or NBA. Some could be it, VCS. You, you never know. Yeah. You never know. They're, they're, if they're alive, they're VCS, automatically. If they're dead, then they're confirmed VC. Did you ever... <clears throat> we ever issued orders on not taking prisoners or disposing. We were uh, we were told do not count prisoners when you're loading them on board the aircraft. Count them when you unload them. Which the naive young brown bar says, well, why? What difference does it make? And the wizened old first lieutenant says, because the numbers may not jive. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, they, you don't count them when they're getting on, because there was a little bit of a feeling here. The guy who told me this was a captain, he, and he, sa he said, don't ever, ever count them when they go aboard, because presumably you'd have to, you'd have to say something if one of them got thrown out. Give your name, what unit you were in, and um, when you were in, and um, you know, just tell a little bit of what you saw to make it more clear, you know, exactly what happened. Sergeant Camille, how are you? You're an F.O. Right. You were there, you were in uh, Alpha Battery 111. Right. I, <laughs> I know this guy, man. <laughs> oh, I'll be right. Uh, Singer, remember Singer? I thought I recognized you. I was sitting over there trying to figure out what the hell you were. Like yeah. My hair was a little bit shorter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> last time I saw you was last year, down in June. You were still down there. Did I get out in 69? We had that down on the... What's this photograph? Oh, about a year and a half ago, I guess, yeah. That's the village being burned. The people were in the village. They, you know, like they wanted time to get their, their goods out and shit. But we just burned down the village and uh, they had, had to leave their goods there or oh, get you, burned. You might be able to come up with that. I was trying to, trying to find somebody that knew something about uh, uh, a bill wiped out in Quang Tree. Right. I was there. You, you got that. Because that was, we went into the area and it was to set the example to show that we weren't fucking around. So the first yeah. thing we do is was burn down the village and kill everybody See, just to let them I know. There, there, and everybody was around. talking about it when I got there. You know? Yeah, this is going to... I know, forgot about it. I didn't even remember that. Fit right in together. Because he's got, he's got the co same company I FO'd for first and I'll pick it up right uh, from there. Okay, well, whenever they're questioning me, they'll have to get me to elaborate on that because I don't know. I forgot all about that one. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how could you forget that? I remembered it and I wasn't even in on it. That was one of the last ones we did because then I went home after that. They did the same thing after I left that we were doing we before I left. Same, same shit. 
Uh, that's, that's, that's exactly what this is all going to bring out, man. You know, same shit. When Operation Stone, we had a, we were sitting up on a railroad trestle, and then there was a river on each side, and there was another company behind each river. And, like, the people were running around inside, and we were just shooting them. And, like, the newspaper said, Operation Stone, like World War II movie, you know, and we just sat up there and we wiped them out, women, children, everything. 291 of them. Is there something that you could, that you really kind of want to say in terms of, of the crimes and why they happen? What bothers you most? I mean, what sort of makes you, what, what brings you here? What makes you say, I want to testify, I want to say something? I'd almost need a book to answer that, man. It's like, uh, just so many things bothered me about about just that short period that I was over there and the whole two years I was in the army. It, I didn't like being an animal and I didn't like seeing everybody else turn into animals either. And, uh, I just sort of hope that in a way I can sort of relate what I saw over there to what's happening here because no matter how much we as veterans can relate to the press or to the public, until you've grasped it, man, you're not going to end that war because it's too distant. A man on the street's too busy making a buck here and he's too worried about getting antifreeze for his car. I'm just getting to a point that it's sort of making me quiet, you know? Sort of making it like I don't know what to say anymore. They've all heard it and they all know what's happening but it's like nothing's happening. You're supposed to feel sorry for American wounded, but you weren't supposed to feel sorry for the enemy wounded or dead. And I just felt sorry for the whole thing. But I guess that's, that doesn't mean anything, just feeling sorry about it. I think what I'd really like to testify about is that it's, it's just hurt a whole generation of Americans and Vietnamese. And that's the biggest atrocity. The, the media is, wants to capitalize, I think, on all these veterans getting together and testifying on all these atrocities. You know, we want to get into the atrocities, but we also want to get into, you know, what are we doing over there in the first place? You know, how do these atrocities get to be committed? You know, they just don't happen. There's a whole thing of how they tell you, you know, that the people over there aren't really people. And it's not one guy just hasn't been doing it. Yeah, it's been pretty much established policy. The front dude got up and wrapped all the shit, they hang him. But they can't deny the testimony of all these dudes in the room. The first day I got to Vietnam, I landed in Da Nang Air Base, got off the plane and hitchhiked on Highway 1 to my new unit, to my unit. I was picked up by a truckload of grunt Marines with two company grade officers, first lieutenants. We were about five miles down the road where there were some Vietnamese children uh, at the gateway of the village, and they gave the old finger gesture, gesture at us. Uh, it was uh, understandable that they picked us up from the GIs there. They stopped the truck. They didn't stop the truck. They slowed down a little bit, and it was just like response. The guys got up, including the lieutenants, and just blew all the kids away. There was about five or six kids blown away there, and then the truck just moved. Uh, continue down the hill. That was my first day in Vietnam. In Quang Tri City, I had a friend who was, uh, he was working with USAID, and uh, one time he asked me would I like to accompany him to watch. He was an advisor with an Arvin group, and he asked me if I would like to accompany him into a village <coughs> that I was familiar with to see how they act. So I went with them, and uh, they didn't find any enemy, but they found a woman with bandages. So she was questioned with about, she was questioned by six Arvins, and the way that they questioned her was since she had bandages, uh, they, sh they shot her. She was hit about 20 times. So after she was questioned, uh, of course dead, uh, this guy come over who was, and knowing him, uh, he was a former major. He was in the service for 20 years, and he, he got hungry again and came back over working with uh, USAID, <laughs> Aid International Development. And uh, he uh, went over there and ripped her clothes off and took a knife and cut from her vagina all the way up, well, just about up to her breast and pulled her organs out completely out of her cavity and threw them out. And then he stopped and knelt over and uh, commenced to peel every bit of skin off her body and left her there as a, as a sign for something or other. In one village, we wounded um, 
uh, women and kids going into the village. And when we got in there, this was in Tuiwa also, when we got in the village, uh, me and another guy, we were treating uh, two unconscious babies, not babies, but like five, six-year-old kids, and uh, a woman lying in a hammock. And I told the lieutenant, these people have to be evacuated because if they're not evacuated, uh, well, this lady had shrapnel on her and the uh, kids had shrapnel on them and they were unconscious. I said, if they're not evacuated, they're going to die. He said, well, forget it, Doc. We don't have time to stay here and wait. And we went up on the hill right above this vi same village and we fired down on this village the next day while people were trying to bury their dead. We fired down on the village at the people while they were doing their uh, burial ceremony and, we, and, we, and they killed another VC. Well, not VC, but another uh, uh, person in the village. Also, um, we went down uh, that, same, that same day to get some water. And there were two little boys playing on a dike. And one sergeant just took his M16 and shot, shot one boy off the dike. The other boy tried to run. When he was almost out of sight, this other, this other guy, um, Spec 4, he shot this other little boy off the dike. And uh, the little boy was like lying on the ground kicking. So he shot him again to make sure he's dead. Then we went into the village and this um, Papa son, the, I, I don't know if he was a village chief or who he was, but he came up to me, came up to us, and he was telling us that um, he was making motions. A bird, you know, was flying over, and the bird took his shit, and the, sh and, and the thing went boom, boom. And uh, he was saying, "This is how, like, a lot of people in the village got got hurt." I think every person who was in Vietnam was in the infantry used CS, which is a gas, chemicals, woolly peter, that's white phosphorus, and we used these sometimes to clear bunkers and other times to uh, destroy a hooch before we'd go into a village or something. If we thought it might be VC infested or something like this, we'd uh, send in Willie Peter mortars, 60 millimeters, and uh, this would burn up the hooches that explode, throwing white phosphorus uh, on different hooches in the village, start the uh, hooches burning, and also kill people. It's probably one of the worst sights I've ever seen is a person that's been burned by Willie Peter because it doesn't stop. It just burns all completely through your body. The only way you can uh, end this uh, burning is to cut off the air. It's very difficult. If, if I could get back to the, uh, the Vietnamese woman I saw that was uh, mutilated so horribly. It, it didn't really shock me because I think I talked about my first day in Vietnam. Uh, you can check with the Marines who've been to Vietnam. Your, your last day in the States, the staging battalion at Camp Pendleton, you have a little lesson. It's called the rabbit lesson, where the staff NCO comes out and he has a rabbit. And he's talking to you about escape and evasion and survival in the jungle. And he has this rabbit, and then after, in a couple of seconds, he, well, everyone just about falls in love with it. Not falls in love with it, but, uh, you know, they're humane there. He cracks it in the neck, skins it, disembowels it just like I sit testified that this happened to a woman. Uh, he does this to a rabbit, and then they throw the guts out in the audience. And uh, you, can, you can get anything out of that you want, but that's your last lesson you catch in the United States before you leave for Vietnam. You have some testimony here on the burning of villages, cutting off of ears, cutting off of heads, calling artillery on villages for games, women raped, napalm on villages. Could you go into just a few of these to let the people know how you treat the Vietnamese civilians? Uh, the calling in of artillery for games, the way it was worked would be uh, the mortar forward observers would call in or we'd pick out certain houses in villages, friendly villages, and the mortar forward observers would call in mortars until they destroyed that house. And then the artillery forward observer would call in artillery until he destroyed another house. And whoever used the least amount of artillery, they won. And then when we got back, someone would have to buy someone else beers. And uh, I saw one case where there were two prisoners, and one prisoner was uh, staked out on the ground, and he was cut open while he was alive. And part of his insides were cutting out. And they told the other prisoner, if he didn't tell them what they wanted to know, that they would kill him. And I don't know what he said, because he spoke in Vietnamese, but then they killed him after that anyway. <coughs> uh, all right, uh, were these uh, primarily civilians, or do you believe that they were, uh, or do you know that they were actual? Uh, um, the way NBA. that we distinguished between uh, civilians and VC, uh, VC had weapons and civilians didn't, and anybody that was dead was considered a VC. If you killed someone, they said, "How do you know he's a VC?" You would, the general reply would be, "He's dead," and that was sufficient.
the cutting off of heads on Operation Stone, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel there, and two people had their heads cut off and put on stakes and stuck in the middle of the field. And we were notified that there were press covering the operation and that we couldn't do that anymore. The general attitude of the officers was, I was a lieutenant at the time, well, there's somebody senior to me here, and I guess if this was an SOP, he'd be doing something to stop it. And since, since nobody senior ever did anything to stop it, the, the policy was promulgated, and everybody assumed that this was what was right. We'd never had any instruction in the Geneva Convention. When we were given our Geneva Convention cards, the lecture consisted of, if you're taken prisoner, all you got to do is give them your name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. Uh, here's your Geneva Convention cards. Go get them, the Marines. We were never told anything about the way to treat prisoners if we were the capturers rather than the captee. Uh, I saw one case where a woman was shot by a sniper, one of our snipers. And when we got up to her, she was asking for water. And uh, the lieutenant said to kill her. So they ripped off her clothes. They stabbed her in both breasts. They spread her eagle and shoved an e-tool up her vagina in a trenching tool, and uh, she was still asking for water. And then they took that out and they used a tree limb, and then she was shot. Did the men in, the, uh, in, in your outfit, or the, did they seem to think that the, uh, it was all right to do anything to the Vietnamese? Uh, where it wasn't like they were humans. Like, we were, you know, we were conditioned to believe that, you know, this was for the the good of the nation, the good of our country, and uh, anything we did was okay. And like, when you shot someone, you didn't think you were shooting a human. They were a gook or a commie, and it was okay. The Vietnamese were gooks. They were all... We didn't uh, just call the VC or the NVA gooks. They were, all Vietnamese were gooks, and they were slant eyes, zips. They were Orientals, and they were, they were inferior to us. So we were Americans. We, we were the, the civilized people, and, uh, you know, they... We didn't give a shit about those people. At the time, did you have any question in your mind that anything wrong was going on? Well, something like this was just too bad. You know, I mean, it was, it was all wrong, you know. It's just that I didn't start really thinking about these things until I came home, because I had to get my head together to start, you know, almost to get up the guts to start talking about this thing, you know, because I've been holding it in for a long time. Uh, I'll throw this question out to anybody. I have heard soldiers testify to personal atrocities that they committed, and yet the fact that they're here means that they're concerned. So what happens to a man over in Vietnam? Well, it's our general conditioning, even before we get in the service. You know, America's always right, the government's right, you don't question them, we're the best, God's on our side. And uh, things like uh, what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki showed it's okay to kill civilians if it's for the best interest of the nation. And when I went there, I went twice, and I believed that it was in the best interest of the nation. And I was sufficiently brainwashed where I did go back the second time because I really believed it was right. I, I you didn't think you feel uh, that morally you shouldn't carry out some of these orders? I felt whatever was in the best interest of my country was what was best, and that's how I was raised to believe. When people see on their television screen films of those who have testified during the uh, winter soldier investigation, they're going to see a lot of people with long hair, a lot of people with beards. Don't you think this is going to turn them off and they're going to disregard a lot of what you say? Um, You're an it, intelligent fellow, I believe it's, you. It's possible. It, um, for six years, my hair never got longer than a quarter of an inch. <laughs> and I always swore I'd keep it that short. But I like it long now. It feels nice. When I was in the Marine Corps and when I first got out of the Marine Corps, I didn't want to talk to anybody who didn't, didn't think that I, Agnew sitteth at the right hand of God. If I was walking down, down the, the center of, of, of Cambridge, where I live, and, and some long-haired kid was walking toward me and he wouldn't get out of the way, I'd knock his ass right into the gutter. And one day, I did that, and a kid said to me, that makes it sort of hard for us to get to know each other. And, he, and I thought that was a joke, and I kept on walking. And I was lying in bed, talking with my wife, and she said, you know, he's really right. Which was... You know, a simple thing, and I could have, that might have gone right over me and never, never affected me whatsoever, but, but my wife has a, a fantastic way of helping me and teaching me how to enjoy life. 
And that's that's the key to, to, to growing and being a better person, is, is talking to people who are different, not to people who are the same. I didn't like school in high school. Uh, it took me four years to finish three years of high school because I was never there. And uh, when I was young, in high school, the big thing to do was every weekend we'd get drunk and we'd go rumble the Cubans at the dance. And we lived in Miami, and that was the thing, you know. And uh, I had seven counts of assault and battery and a three-year sentence to Rayford, which was suspended. And uh, I, had, I had to go in the service, and I went in the Marines for four years. What do you mean you had to yeah. go in the service? Well, it was just I was on probation, and then I got in another fight. So they were going to, you know, just pull the rug out from under me. And my lawyer told the judge that... Uh, it would be better if I went in the service and they'd fix me up. If I went in jail, I'd be uh, bad to society when I came out. Did you want to go in the service, Scott? Uh, I did, uh, but not, so, not as soon. Uh, I wanted to go in the service because uh, I really believed that uh, the war was right. And I think one of the main things was I wanted to see, see for myself whether I was really a man or not. And I figured that's how I could find out. Like, people were trying to save me, you know, and they'd say, you know, you'll really find God overseas, you know. When you really need him, you'll find him. And uh, I wanted to see what kind of a person I really was. Was I really brave? Was I a chicken? And uh, I believed in the war, and I believed, you know, the best thing a person could do was give his life for his country. So I, I went in the Marine Corps, and I got to Paris Island, and they really changed my head around. I was, uh, if I thought I could have escaped, I would have. You were good at it? No. No, they they knocked, they broke two of my teeth because I uh, didn't conform as quickly as I was supposed to. And uh, well, can you talk about the specific incident? Yeah, we were supposed to run three miles before each meal and three miles after each meal with full packs. And uh, I just couldn't see throwing up my meal, you know. And uh, in boot camp, you're not allowed to talk without permission. And for instance, uh, if I wanted to go to the bathroom, I would say, "Sir, private Camille requests permission to speak, sir." And he'd say. What do you want, turd? And I say, sir, Private Camille requests permission to make a head call, sir. And he'd say, is it an emergency? And I say, yes, sir. And then he had alternatives what he could do. He could say, okay, go around the room three times with your siren to prove it's an emergency. And you'd have to run around the room going, rrr, rrr. and if you didn't do it fast, you know, loud enough, then it wasn't really an emergency. Or else he could say, uh, okay, we'll wait one hour, and if you don't go, then you lie to me, and then I'm going to kick your ass. So, like, you had a choice of either pissing in your pants or getting your ass kicked. And, like, do, you know, things that normally you didn't happen to you, it's kind of bad for your head. And if I would have gotten out of there, I would have. So, the day we were running, I just, I didn't run. I just started walking. And if the man in front of you falls down, you have to run him over. If you go around him, you get beat up. Because if he knows you're going to run him over, he won't fall down. So, I just stepped out to the side and let him all run past me <laughs> and started walking. And they said run, you know. He says, what's your, he said, what's your name? I said, Private Camille, sir. He says, you better start running. I says, I'm tired. <laughs> and he says, get up in the barn, you're going to be sorry. I said, I'm already sorry. <laughs> so I went up there and they called where we lived, the barn. And they were going to send me to Motivation Platoon. That's where they, uh, that makes boot camp seem like Sunday school. So then they said, okay, we'll, we'll handle it in the closet, closet motivation. So I went in the closet and the Two of them came in, they said, about face, and I turned around, and two fists hit me. And I didn't even fight back. I said, okay, <laughs> you know, I give up, I'll run. <laughs> so uh, when I got done, like the last day in boot camp, they said, now you've earned the name Marines, now you're men, you know. And I was really gung-ho, and I was ready to sign up for 50 years, you know, because I thought the worst part was over. And uh, then I went to Vietnam. And my third week in Vietnam, I was standing guard, on an artillery base, and there were 16 of us on guard, four in each corner of the base. And uh, our grenades were taped up, so if the pins came out by accident, the spoons wouldn't fly and no one would get hurt. And our rifles weren't allowed to be loaded, and the rules were we couldn't load without permission and we couldn't fire without permission. And if you saw something, you'd call the sergeant the guard in the guard shack. Well, the sergeant the guard walked around and checked to make sure people weren't sleeping. And when he was going around, the gooks got him. So then when the people saw the gooks inside the fence, they asked for permission and there was no one there and they didn't fire. So they, they just wiped us out. 
And uh, my post was the only post they didn't take. They took the other three posts. And as soon as I saw them, like, I wasn't going to ask anybody. We just started shooting. And uh, we had stacked up 40 bodies inside the perimeter, inside the fence. And uh, we had 28 men wounded, five men killed, and uh, five 105 howitzers, those are big artillery guns, destroyed by this suicide thing. And I wrote my congressman and asked him how come we couldn't have our weapons loaded and how come we needed permission to fire and things like that. And uh, a few people in my outfit got relieved. Is that the first time that you killed anyone? That was anyone? the first time I killed anyone. And the next morning, I looked at, uh, I went and I looked at my five friends that were dead. And uh, I pulled the sheets off of them and I looked at them real close. And then I said, you know, like, you know, this is really real. Someone wants to really kill me. And, uh, you know, if I make one mistake, I don't get another chance. So I can't make any mistakes. And that's what I said. And I decided at that point that I would kill anyone I could, you know, knowing whether they were innocent or not, just to make sure I wouldn't get killed. And that was my philosophy. Like, if I'd go into a village and have to kill 100, and pe 100 people just to make sure there was no one there to shoot me when I walked out, that's what I did. And uh, that's what I did when I was there. Do you feel that the, your boot camp training sort of prepared you for that kind of attitude at all? Well, in boot camp, we used to, th uh, every night we had to say, uh, before we went to bed, we'd have to sing the Marine Corps hymn. And with laying in attention in bed, we'd sing the Marine Corps hymn, and then we'd say, another day in the Corps, sir, for every day is a holiday, and every meal is a feast. Pray for war. Pray for war. God bless the Marine Corps. God bless my drill instructors. Pray for war. And every night we had to say that. And uh, when we'd run and we'd sing songs, we'd sing, uh, like they say, kill, kill, kill. And when we, uh, at our um, and, uh, judo practice and knife fighting practice and bayonet fighting practice, it was always, that was the yell, kill, kill, kill. And, uh, you know, boy, you're going to get to go over there and kill some gooks, you know. And uh, it was something that we were looking forward to, you know, to put our training to use. And, and serve our nation's best interest. Well, we thought it was our nation's best interest. Uh, due to the fact that uh, one of the men has to leave very shortly, uh, Nathan Hale, uh, I'd like to uh, let him testify to the uh, interrogation procedures at this time. I arrived at the base camp of uh, the first of the first camp, which is Hill 29. When I arrived there, my S2, my captain, told me that my job was to elicit information. And this meant that I could elicit information in any means possible. He told me that I can use any technique I can think of, and the idea is don't get caught. And what he meant was I could beat these people, I could cut them, I could, uh, I could probably shoot them. I, I never shot anyone, but I could use any means possible to get information. Just don't beat them in the presence of uh, a non-unit uh, member or person. That's uh, someone like a visiting officer or, uh, or perhaps the Red Cross. And uh, I personally used clubs, rifle butts, pistols, knives, and uh, this was always done at Hill 29. Uh, the important point here is that, that everything I did was always monitored. An interrogator is always monitored. I was monitored by an MP sergeant at Hill 29, who often uh, helped me in my interrogations. He and his squad. Uh, this is a, a group of detainees being brought in. OK, there's an interrogation uh, going on right here. It's a big production. These are all the Marines sitting around giving the various cheers. This man here is a warrant officer. This just shows, uh, you know, a, a typical Vietnamese who's bound. Uh, uh, these are National Field Police. This man came over and put a, uh, a tin spoon, it's a Vietnamese spoon, and he put it in my fire, and he's burning the skin off of the back of the man's neck. And finally, the man, uh, in fear of his life, admitted that uh, at one time he had given tax to uh, the VC, but you can't prove that. I heard uh, earlier today that uh, they used CS. Well, the Marines used a lot of CS. This particular man wouldn't come out of the hole, and they threw two CS grenades in. I personally escorted this man back to division, and he died. So if gas doesn't kill, I don't know what killed him. Murphy, let me ask you a question. How 
Did you encourage information from the um, from your detainees or from the prisoners that you captured in the field? Well, first of all, we would ask. And if uh, we didn't get the information, or if they said they didn't know anything, we figured they were lying. Well, we'd go to torture. And uh, by torture, I mean we. First time I ever saw it used. The first time was on Operation Junction City One. We were over by the Cambodian border in War Zone C. We had just walked into a ambush, and uh, out of this ambush we took. We had about approximately 15 casualties. Out of that, we had about five killed out of those 15. We picked up five or six prisoners. And uh, while flying them back, going to our fire support base, we had a lieutenant that had been in country about five days. And uh, he said that he was going to conduct the interrogation. So uh, we were explaining to him that we had qualified people in the rear to do this. but. Uh, he told us to shut up, he was a lieutenant. So, boom, that ended that. So he asked two or three questions, and all of them kept saying, uh, no beck, a moolah, or something. Explain and, what that uh, means to the... I don't know, you know. I'm, or, you know, I'm not going to tell you, I don't know. I believe this, I don't know. Then he ordered for the door to be open, the middle of the door. And just, without another word, he just pushed one out. And then he started asking, he said, are you going to tell me now? And he started, you know, put his gun on it. So all this time we're looking at it. And uh, we're kind of mad, too, because we had been out there and some of our friends had been killed or wounded. And uh, at the time, it really didn't mean anything to us. He pushed out another one. And now the third one he came to, he started to saying something in Vietnamese and pointing to the one, uh, one of them on the end. And uh, as we found out after searching this fellow, that he was a lieutenant in... Uh, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese Army. And uh, on the way in after this, he said, uh, if anything was said about this, he would make it harder on us. Okay, so he wrote himself up for a medal by detaining, uh, getting information from prisoners and uh, saving us from walking into another ambush, evidently. But uh, he received a bronze star with a V device in it for it, for valor. The V stood for valor. We started going on little missions, search and destroy missions, in old and K. And uh, we ran into a few NVA that came to us. Uh, what was the word? Dung? Uh, Chuhoy. Chuhoy. And right on the spot we're taking the prisoners, a lieutenant came up and said, it's a three-day pass for any body. If you can prove that you've killed an NVA, you have a three-day pass to Vong Tau. That's the in-country R&R &R Center. And uh, right there at that point, I actually, with my eyes, I saw a first sergeant and a lieutenant actually fight over who the prisoners were killed. They were taken and killed right there on the spot. But who killed them was, uh, they just started to fight right there. And uh, it's been quite a few incidents like that that I couldn't recall, but everybody up here, we said just about the same thing. But um, I have helped in torturing prisoners. And at one time, we thought it was showing courage or bravery or whatever you want to call it. We wore ears. We did. We'd take them and catch them while they were alive, take an ear. Because, see, the Vietnamese people believe if they die without all of their bodies, that they won't go to Buddha heaven. And we would do this to two or three of them to get information from the rest of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the first slide you're going to see shows a prisoner of war and the way that uh, they uh, try to get him to talk is by making him stand in front of a pile of uh, Viet Cong bodies that we had picked up. It's the same POW was forced to sit uh, for f probably from six to eight hours by this pile of bodies in the hot sun. Uh, it's a shot of five or six uh, GIs going through the bodies looking for souvenirs. In this picture, there's a lieutenant and a captain overlooking what's going on. This is a shot of our interrogator. Uh, he took, took his M16. He took him and forced him into this uh, prisoner's nose. He twisted him. It's extremely painful. 
uh, officers were present at all times. Yes, field grade officers were present. Were present. And the next slide is a slide of myself. I'm uh, extremely shameful of it. I'm showing it in hopes that none of you people that, that have never been involved ever let this happen to you. Don't let, ever let your government do this to you. It's me holding a dead body, smiling. Uh, everyone in our uh, platoon took two bodies, put them on the uh, back ramp, drove them through a village for show, and uh, dumped them off the uh, edge of the village. Uh, you uh, mentioned the killing of wounded prisoners. Uh, would you uh, talk about that also? All right, on uh, June 13th on Operation Cannon Falls, now twice during the night we were overrun on our lower lip. Uh, the whole night we only sustained three uh, dead people and ten wounded. Now in the morning, when the mist cleared about 5.30, Everybody just got out of their holes and we started to sweep down towards the bottom of the hill to uh, you know, count our body count and see how brave we were. And there was one NVA soldier who was caught on the wire. He had a bullet wound through the neck and numerous shrapnel wounds all th through his body from fragmentation grenades. Now this big badass corporal took out his knife and stuck it in his neck and just jiggled it till a man bled to death because he didn't want to carry him to the top of the hill. Another man was laying at the bottom of the hill on his stomach he was in pretty bad shape, but uh, I think he would have made it. And three grunts emptied a full magazines of M16 fire in his back. Another man who was shot at the top of the hill had a bullet wound in his thigh, two in his back, and his elbow was hanging off by a thread. He was screaming for water, and they just poured it on the ground. They laughed at him. They kicked him in the ribs. One time, he just jumped up spastically, and he sat up on his waist, and his arms started to dangle. And a grunt kicked him in the chest, and he died. Now, after all this happened, they chased what was left of the NVA uh, company out through the woods. Now, the following day, uh, elements of Golf Company claimed that they saw 400 NVA walking along a trail. Well, I informed this to this major there since I was in the uh, COC bunker on radio watch. He told me I was an asshole. So I called up Golf Company again, and I said, uh, you know, repeat this. This guy doesn't believe me. So he told me again I was an asshole because Recon said there are no NVA in this area, even though the previous night we were hit by a company and a half. Well, about a day following, Hotel Company, and Gordon was there at the time, was uh, hit by, a, I think, about half a regiment, I'm not sure. But they were in contact for nine hours. A major was on the net, and the captain from Hotel called up, and he was crying because they were pinned down for nine hours. And he wanted air support, and he wanted to be lifted out of there because they, they were pretty well chopped up. They had hand-to-hand -hand fighting. They were running out of ammunition. A major got on the air, and I quote, called him a fucking pussy. He said, never in Vietnam has any infantry unit been withdrawn. And he says, you people can do it by yourself. I don't care if you've been there nine hours or nine weeks. He says, you're going to stay out there until there's none of you left or until we come and get you. Now, that later on that night, I took the casualty report. It was 14 pages. There was 43 killed and about 30 wounded. And a lot of them were my friends. Now, they claim they killed 100 Viet Cong. But Gordon says they killed two or 300. Stars and Stripes claim that only 35 Americans were killed and wounded. Now, uh, I don't know, uh, I know they're pretty confused out there, but it's pretty fucked up when uh, not even Stars and Stripes can figure out how many people are what. I'd like to add on that, since, since I was there and wounded there, that uh, they wouldn't bring any ammunition into us, food or water. They were, the helicopters were afraid of getting hit because the one helicopter that came in for a medevac was shot down in the river. We managed to get all the dead out, but, and wounded out, I mean, but one it was a gunner, I believe. Uh, I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, I think one of the biggest ways the guys would personally fight the army or any policy was what is termed malingering or shamming. Any way you could damage yourself. Guys, the first t time I walked into my unit, I, wa I walked in and a brother was laying on a bed, stoned out of his mind, and another brother came down with a bat on his leg, broke it right in front of me, and like, uh... You know, I asked, I said, like, what's happening? And he says, home, you just go out and hump the bush for a while and you'll find out. And you're scared. You're so scared that you'll shoot anything. You'll look at your enemy. You'll look at them as animals. And in the same time, you're, uh, you're just turning yourself into an animal, too. And I'd say that's, that's got my head spinning a little 
little right now the fact that I was actually one time an animal and that now I have to come back and be civil again and people sort of expect a purpose and expect you uh, just to have a definite purpose you know you're going to school yeah you're going to work yeah but like there's just more and more veterans now that are just finding that there's no purpose because nobody's ever given us one the only purpose I had was surviving and getting the hell out and uh, that's about all I can say unless anybody wants to ask anything. I just know that you know, we learned somewhere along the line that a dink was less than a person. Uh, and these things go on, they really happen. I don't know how to, man, I can't talk, I can't tell you people. Uh, incidences or whatever you want to hear. I'm just here because it goes on and somebody's got to do something. And here I am, you know. I can't really say why we did it. Maybe it was because we were taught to hate him. I was told by my own lieutenant, well, he saw me wearing one of these bracelets. He told me, he asked me why I was wearing it. I told him, I said, well, a Vietnamese boy gave it to me. I said, he was a token of his friendship, really. He liked me and I liked him. We gave each other gifts, I suppose. And uh, he told me to take it off. And uh, of course, I didn't agree. I didn't want to take it off. I didn't feel I should. But, uh, he told me these are the same people. He says, why do you accept gifts from the same people that go out and put mines in the roads and blow up your buddies? And uh, he told me if I didn't take it off, he'd go to more maybe drastic measures. I don't know. He just dismissed me. But uh, I don't know. I don't want to give any blood stories or nothing. I don't. I just can't do it. I just. I want you to know that the people over there aren't really being treated as human beings. They're being treated as slaves, let's say. Maybe not even slaves. I don't know. It's, I don't know. I just don't know what to say. I just want you to know about it. I'd sort of like to just add one more, one more thing about yeah, it. Yeah, Steve, go ahead. Uh, I'd say that the government and a lot of the people uh, who sort of run this nation have been telling a lot of GIs that the biggest detriment to, to uh, our morale has been the uh, long-haired protesting uh, pinko sympathizer type. But I think the biggest lift for my morale came when I was in the, uh, I was lying in Okinawa in the hospital there and a girl wrote me about a place called Woodstock where 500,000 people had come together and it was, it was so beautiful. I, that was the first time I smiled in a long time. I was put as platoon leader of my platoon simply because, you know, this dude had bugged me and I had put this behind, you know, and they liked that aggressiveness. I had, all right, yeah. you going to be a platoon leader? Yes, sir. Are you sure you're going to be a Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, this is the whole thing. You know, this thing is a crack, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm platoon leader for a little while, and this dude, he messes up the whole platoon. He sneaks in the bathroom and he's smoking. So, uh, you know, me and a couple of other dudes, we're, our minds are sacked now, you know. Damn, we whipped the living daylights out of them. Acres coming, yes, sir. What you be the rest? No, sir. Yes, you did. I saw you do it. You had enough time. The whole thing, you know, and the next thing I know it, you know, I'm not a platoon leader anymore. I'm back in the ranks again, you know. Then I'm put on the shit list, you know, a week later, you know, you're in trouble. You can knee deep, you know. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? This thing, you know. They were they were very good at it, you know. They had your minds. You couldn't win. I remember they had us out from Foot Locker. We were doing uh, manual of arms with Foot Lockers. You know, this guy next to me, Prince, you know, drops it on his foot. And I thought it was very <coughs> funny. It was amusing. You know, we were so tired. Everything's amusing, you know. Mm -hmm. I in there. He drops in the center. <sighs> Now it says, 1027, sir, 1027, sir. We got a pussy? Yes, sir. Who is it? Ivan Atten. 
Get up here, sweet pea. So I get up there and he says, you like to laugh? Said, no, sir. Yes, you do. You like to laugh. I said, no, sir. Laugh for me. I said, ah, ah, ah. He says, open that big fucking mouth and laugh for me. So I did. And he started taking handfuls of sand every time I my mouth to laugh, you know, and shove it down my throat. I said, laugh. <laughs> Freaks were good like that, or licking off the toe of the shoe. I come running out of the hooch one day for formation. He says, get the herd in the road, you know, so. And everybody starts skying up to get on the road, and I come walking out the door, and I stepped on a spit shine shoe. And, like, the freak just grabs me around by a stack and swivel, you know, and uh, pulls me up. He says, you better take care of that. Sir. I, I said, request permission to go in and get my shoe shine gear. He says, oh, the only shoe shine gear you need, boy, is your tongue. You know, so he had me get down there and lick off the dust off his toe where I'd scuffed his stupid thing, you know. Well, and, like, uh, they do that all the time to break you. I'll I, I tell you a trick they pull. Uh, they'll take a, a company and they'll pull them back into battalion. They'll keep them there for darn near a month with no contact whatsoever with enemy troops. All right. Then all of a sudden, hey, we found a Viet Cong regiment. We're getting ready to move out tomorrow morning. Stand by. Keys your mind. All of a sudden, you're getting a chance to get a piece of some action because you're tired of sitting around in mud holes, you know, doing nothing. I have yet to have been on an operation where I haven't gone through a village. I have yet. And I have yet to have gone on an operation where when I've gone through that village, that village was still standing. So consequently, you know, you're ready, you know, and you're keyed up. You're tired of sitting down. They ship you, drop your helicopter. You're receiving a few small arms fire. They call it heavy, you know. I mean, yeah. <laughs> wow, you're, you're receiving, you know, heavy fire. But you receive, you know, you might hear a, 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 a car being fired from a half a mile. You know, wow, you know. And everybody's yelling, open fire, open fire. Hey, what, at what? And I, I don't see a soul. And I'm, you know, supposed to be charged to shoot. You know, it's just like I was playing war games back in Hawaii. Yeah, so, really. You know, with blanks in my gun. They're, they're like overgrown shit. When you go to Vietnam, you're prepared to play the Marine Corps role. You're assuming the role as a, a professional Marine, a killer, whatever, and you're going to play that out exactly the way it's been defined to you. Things like this here work on the mind. And if they can, de if they can deteriorate portions of the mind for any period of time, see, then they could just about gear you into doing anything they want. In fact, I was so weird after Vietnam, I carried a pistol around my back pocket, uh, you know, for no apparent reason to myself for six months until one day I pulled it on somebody at school. I had torn up something in janitor to come up to uh, tell me, hey man, you can't do that. And I reached out and pulled the pistol on him. And then it occurred to me, man, you know, there's something wrong with me. And uh, it took me well, like a week and a half to realize, I remember the incident where we stoned the kid. I never thought that my mind would hide anything from me. And uh, it's really strange when it does. It came as a, you know, a real surprise. The stuff just started coming back. Uh, once you come back from the Nam, your awareness of uh, not only the Vietnam War, but of the uh, government is fantastic. And you know, it's a whoa. Hey, wow, you mean this is what I've been asleep under all this time? You know, Jesus Christ, somebody hit me with a baseball bat. You know, you know, I've been asleep. You know, what's going on? So, you know, uh, it's a no wonder they come back and say, you ain't got nothing to show me. Yeah. 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 is really a totally unreal situation after a few months. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, what should be brought out is the horror of the everyday, the commonplace, what went on there. My duty was uh, to go out and serve as a perimeter guard on the Dong Ha ramp. And this was an LCU ramp on the Quaviet River where uh, Navy ships came up and they'd offload supplies. And we took our truck with, uh, outside the combat base every night at 5.30 to set up at the ramp uh, for our night's uh, duty. And we used to drive by this row of hooches, and a little three-year-old kid in uh, dirty gray shorts used to run out and scream, you Marines, number 10. And we'd always go back, oh, fuck you, kid, you know, all this stuff. And uh, so one night, the kid comes out and says, Marine, you're number 10, and throws a rock. So we figured we'd get him, because this was a way of having fun. And the next night before we went out, we all stopped by COC, which is right by the ammo dump, picked up the biggest rocks we could get our hands on, and piled it in the back of the truck. So when we left the combat base, uh, we just turned the corner and we saw a little kid. We were waiting for the kid. He ran out of the hooch and he's going to scream Marine number 10. And we didn't even let him get it out of his mouth. He just picked up all the rocks and smeared him. We just wiped him out. And in fact, the force of the rocks was enough to knock over his little tin hooch as well. And uh, I don't know. I, don't, I can't say that the kid died, but if it would have been me, I would have died easily. The rocks, some of them were as easily as big as his head. 
And uh, it was looked upon as funny. We all laughed about it. And then we forgot about it. And it, it took me about a year to even be able to recall the situation. Uh, I think it said something about the entire attitude of us over there. I never had a specific hatred for the Vietnamese. Uh, I just tended to ignore them. Uh, they didn't they didn't figure in any calculation as to being human. They just either got in the way or they weren't there. It used to be a game we'd play. We'd pour garbage, liquid garbage, off the end of our truck uh, to make them crawl for it. Mama Sans would come up with half-cut 50-gallon drums, and uh, they'd try and fill it up. They'd get pork chops and sloppy rice and uh, mystery meat or wop slop, whatever we'd had for chow, and uh, put it in there, and then we'd let them walk so far, and then we'd tip it over, spill it on the ground, and watch them scrape the dirt in there. Anything to uh, dehumanize them. At the time I was there, nobody ever got hurt in the garbage dump, as far as Americans. But a lot of uh, Vietnamese women and children were hurt. And it was fair game between uh, Con Thien going through the city of Cam Lo, on the outskirts of Quang Tri going to Stud, that uh, American troops would stock up on their heavies, their spaghetti and meatballs and ham and lima beans. And any little children who were begging along the side of the road, which uh, never numbered less than 50 or 60, uh, were fair game for... Uh, these full cans of food, they wouldn't throw them to the kids, they just bounce them off their heads or try to knock them off their bicycles. These people are aware of, of what American soldiers do to them, so naturally they, they try to hide the, the young girls. Uh, we found one hiding in a bomb shelter in the, sort of the basement of her house. Uh, she was taken out and raped by six or seven people in front of her family, uh, in front of most of the villagers. Uh, this, is, this wasn't just one instance, this is just the first one that I can remember, but uh, I know of 10 or 15 of such instances at least. Uh, the gentleman on my left can collaborate my testimony as we were together the whole time, served in the same squad and the same company. Uh, at the time, most of this happened. Our platoon leader was a Mormon minister. He's dead now, so he can't really be found out in questions. But, but when he got there, he was pretty well high character man because he was a minister. And by the time he left, well, by the time he got killed, rather, he was condoning everything that was going on because it was a part of policy. If nobody tells you that it's wrong, then you do it anyway. And this is how it changed him around. Uh, once we were picking up a sling load of ammunition, and the Army had a habit of putting uh, pickup zones and drop-off zones right near well-traveled roads, you know, tra you know, roads traveled by the local villagers. So we were uh, hovering over this sling load of, uh, I think it was howitzer, howitzer rounds. And I was wa uh, hanging out the window, observing a, what appeared to be about, you know, I guess he was about 12-year-old Vietnamese boy standing there watching us. And as we lifted up with the load, uh, the rotor wash increased because of the weight, and it blew him into the path of a two-and-a-half-ton truck with trailer, which killed him instantly. When that happened, my first reaction, and my flight engineer, he was observing this too. Our first reaction was, I guess you'd call normal. It would be uh, horror pain. And then I realized that I caught myself immediately and I said, no, you, you can't do that because you develop a shell while you're in the, in the military. They brainwash you. They, they take all the humanness out of you. And you develop this crust which enables you to survive in Vietnam. And uh, if you let that, that protective shell down, even for a second, it could mean uh, that it's the difference between you flipping out or managing to uh, make it through. And I caught myself letting the shell down, and I, and I tightened up right away and uh, started laughing about it and joking about it with the flight engineer. And uh, he sort of moved on the same logic, because I guess he caught, it sort of knocked his shell down, too. Uh, in one incident, we were flying, and we took uh, fire from 6 NVA, which caused the ship to explode in the air. Uh, and make a crash landing. Now, on the way down, because our p company policy was to just keep on firing, uh, I looked out across the field, 
and I spotted a Vietnamese woman, a peasant, running away from the ship. I fired a burst of about six or seven rounds into her back before we fired, before we, we hit the ground. When I was being questioned as to what happened about two weeks later by uh, a captain in my company, I told him what, what we did and what I did, and we both had a good laugh about it. That was pretty much uh, company policy. Uh, we did. I saw a lot of things happening and being done by guys, and I really, you know, like the emotional thing, you know, you see your buddy get killed, and it's really emotional, someone you're really good friends with. Like one minute he's telling you, well, you know, I got a letter from my girl, I'm really happy, you know, and I can't wait to see her. And she's going to send me some pictures she's taken. She's, she's getting her girlfriend to take some nice Polaroid pictures of me, you know. And then the, you go out and he gets shot in the head. And, you know, it was, it was really hard for you to realize that, you know, five minutes ago you, he was your friend and now he's dead. And uh, you'd put him on the helicopter and just make believe he went home. You try not to think that he was killed. And then you say, well, I'm going to get the gooks for it. And you just take it out on all the gooks. And it got to be where it was like someone would say, okay, you know, you come stay on my farm and you can go hunting every day for free and I'll give you all the ammo you want. And uh, you can hunt and there's no limit. And you can go all go out together and just hunt, you know. And that's what, it was like a hunting trip. And uh, the more people we killed, the happier our officers were, you know. It got to be like a game. Like the object was to see who could kill the most people. And... Uh, the different ways you could prove how many people you killed would be like cutting off ears. Now, if you brought back someone's ears, you know, pretty likely you had to kill them to get them. And then people would, you know, whoever had the most ears, they would get the most beers. And you'd trade your ears for beers. And uh, it got to be like a game. And uh, when it came time to go home, I, you know, like I, I was very close to my friends. And I, I got where I, I knew what I was doing, you know, like I was a, like an expert. Uh, my job being a, a forward observer is also a scout sergeant. And you have to learn to read maps and know the area. And I got where I knew where I was without looking at the maps. And I could call in artillery just by knowing where I was. And I was really attached to my friends. I couldn't see leaving my friends and going home. And then I, I thought about the political thing again. I said, well, you know, and I wrote my le mother a letter. And I told her, I said, I'm not coming home in April because uh, I really believe what we're doing is right. And I think it's better for me to stay here and help get it cleaned up if I can, than for my brother to have to come over when he gets old enough. And that's what I wrote, and that's what was put in the newspaper. And they had a big article, you know, we need more Americans like this. What was your rank when you first went over? A PFC. And when you left? A sergeant. I made a lance corporal, corporal and sergeant. I made a very good rank. So you'd say the Army thought you were a good soldier? I got a good conduct medal, too, and I, I got the Vietnamese cross the gallantry with Silver Star, and put up, got put up for the Bronze Star three times. And uh, this is something else I'd really like to rip about medals. You know, medals are a bunch of shit. Uh, every time I thought I deserved one, no one ever said anything. And when I didn't think I deserved some, I got one, you know. And it was uh, like one time I picked up a grenade that was thrown at us, and I threw it back. And they thought I was really brave. But it was because that was the easiest thing to do. Like, I wasn't going to fall on it and save anybody's life, because I, I wasn't that brave or stupid or whatever. And I wasn't going to, you can't stand there and look at it, and you can't run from it because you can't get away from it. And the only chance I figured I had would be to pick it up and throw it away. And they thought I was doing something brave, and I got put up for a medal, but I was doing the most cowardice thing. And uh, another time I got a medal, uh, these gooks came out in front of us, and uh, I was with the infantry. And, but the infantry had to work together. I could move on my own because I was a forward observer. So we were eating, we didn't have our boots or clothes on, you know, just our pants. And I slipped into my boots and I grabbed my ammo and my rifle and I didn't get on my uh, helmet or a flak jacket or anything. I went after them and I got five of them. So I got a medal for it. But they never, I was running after them, I was chasing them. They never stopped and turned around and fired at me. I didn't risk my life or anything. And uh, they thought it was really brave. And I, they yelled at me for going out there and doing that because the forward observer is not supposed to give away his position. But it, it was really fun. It wasn't anything brave at all. You know, I got five commies, man. Well, now I'm really happy. Wait till my parents hear this. Uh, then that, that night, uh, we were on a, a scorpion. That's where four or five guys go out, and they just hide. And when the enemy come by, you open fire, and then you run. You know, and they don't know how many of you there are. So, so usually they, they pull back, too. And two of them came walking right by us, and three of the guys were asleep. And I didn't want to shoot because I didn't want to give away my position. So I grabbed the guy in front of me, around the mouth, and I stabbed him in the kidney, and I killed him. And uh, 
the guy next to me, he opened fire on his and he missed. So for, give it, for getting those six kills, I got the medal. But I, another time I had a, a friend of mine killed and I was very upset. And I asked this Vietnamese for his ID card and he said, come biak, and that means I don't understand in Vietnamese. And it just pissed me off, so I pulled out my knife and I killed him. And uh, it didn't bother me at all. I just called in, I said, one VC kill. And they said, how do you know he's a VC? And I said, because he's dead. And they laughed and said, okay, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I'd come in and people would ask me what's going on out in the front, and I'd tell them. And uh, they'd keep it short for how many kills you have. And I'd come in and they'd show me how many I have. And what it is, every time you kill someone, you have to report it. And uh, you have to search them for papers and stuff. But uh, this is something else, body count. If 10 of us would go out and I'd come back with only five men, we'd lost half our men. And you couldn't say that you didn't see any enemy. So you could have only killed one enemy. And by the time it would get up to the high command, you know, you killed 50 of them because they couldn't say that they, they lost five men taking one. So the body count's a bunch of shit. You know, what they say and what they get is different things. Like you'd read the newspaper on Operation Medina, uh, 200 of us went out and about 47 of us made it back. And they just ambushed us and wiped the hell out of us. And I didn't, I didn't see any gooks, man. They were sitting in the trees dropping grenades on us and they had machine guns on the front and the side. And uh, the newspaper said we had all these kills, you know. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I never saw any kills. But they just didn't want, like, to admit that all those men got killed for nothing. Uh, did you think that that was a justifiable thing? I mean, there you knew there was a lie, but did you see a reason for it at the time? Uh, I, I didn't question it. Like, uh, I figured, well, that the people home think we're killing them, you know, that's great, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, uh, another thing is the competition between units. Besides competition between men to kill the most, there's competition between squads and between companies and battalions to see who can kill the most. So, like, if the newspaper said Charlie Company got 200 kills and we didn't get any, we weren't going to say anything, man. We wanted them to think, we're bad guys, man. And we thought we were so tough, we went around with aces of spades and our helmets. And every time we'd kill someone, we'd put it in their face. So if anyone else came, they knew that Charlie Company did it, you know. Vietnam is not a land war. Uh, if you gain land um, as in other wars, your efficiency report would go up. In this war, it's based on body count. The more people you kill, uh, the better efficiency report, officer's efficiency report um, you get. So what happened here uh, is a case of the colonels going into competition and um, making up more bodies than they really have. And this was, of course, passed on down to the company commanders and the platoon leaders and the squad leaders. So uh, hell, we were reporting stuff, uh, water buffalo, uh, in some cases, uh, shadows. I remember one time I called artillery into a wood line where I received sniper fire and uh, didn't check the wood line and called in three uh, body count. Um, this, was, this went on all the time. Um, other firefights, we, the, the count would be 80, 90, and personally I only saw two, three bodies. So it's, it's a totally inflated system and <coughs> what's happened is the American public's been lied to. The Army has come out and stated that we've got a kill ratio of one to 13 and yes, it's 1 to 13 because of this inflation, but it's a lot of bull. Going along with what Scott said, they didn't care what you were doing or how you were getting it. They wanted bodies, and that's where civilians came in also. In November of 68, in an area called the Wagon Wheel, which is northwest of Saigon, while on a routine search and destroy mission, gunships were to be providing security and cover for us in case we had any contact, were circling overhead. Well, no contact was made, and the gunships got bored. So they made a gun run on a hooch uh, with many guns and rockets. Uh, when they left the area, we found one dead baby, which was a young child, uh, very young, in its mother's arms. And we found, we found a a baby girl about three years old that were dead because these people were bored and they were just sick of flying around doing nothing. Then, as we re when it was reported to battalion, uh, the only reprimand was to put the two bodies on the body count board 
and just add them up with the rest of the dead people. Uh, there was no reprimand, there was nothing. We tried to call the gunship off, and there was nothing you could do. You know, he just made his run, dropped his ordinance, and left. And there they were, man. And the mother was, there, of course, hysterical. How would you like if someone came in and shot your baby? And there was nothing we could do, man. I just watched it. And nothing happened. I have no idea what happened to the helicopter pilot or to anyone in the gunship. It was gone. And things like this happen, I'm sure, more than once. Because if I saw it, I'm sure there are a lot of veterans who aren't here who saw it. And this is why we have to stop the war. Because not only are we killing our brothers in the armed forces and brothers in the other, on the other side, but we're killing innocent people, man. Innocent civilians who are just standing by and happen to be at that place at that time. And for no other reason than that, I wind up dead. I've been in there listening to this whole thing, the whole thing tonight, man. You know what? It, yeah, it's relevant, man. But you know what? Even this whole thing you're doing now, it's only relevant to you, man. It ain't relevant to me. You know how come? Because you fail to realize what the reason is, man. How come? You know, dig, you're going in there and you're getting all these reports, man, on atrocities. Yeah, man. They were splitting this cat's skull and they were splitting that skull, splitting his skull. But you know what? The real issue is, man, that the thing is racism. It's I know racist. That, brother. It's racist, I man. They're over there after the Vietnamese, you know, the resources. they also after the Vietnamese because they're racist, man. I had all the hell I had in the Army because of racism. You know, like, dig, man, my orderly room, man, my first sergeant, man, was a Ku Klux Klan, man. They had a motherfucking clap right in the Let fucking Let me ask company. you a question. What have I got to gain out of this? What, what, what the hell man? do you think I'm fucking here for? What the hell do you think the rest of us are here for? For your reason. For my reason. For your reason. My, my and I dig this. Your reason for being here is different from my reason. Your reason is different from mine. Why Just like everybody was in there running Why? Out. Why? Running the troops We're home. here. What? Everybody well, crapping, You got to start, man. You got to start someplace. We got to start now. We can get the troops out of Nam. And we can start this fucking hatred and shit that's going on around this. The thing that's getting me, the thing that gets me, man. Don't, 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 don't no, get upset. This, 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 yeah. cool. this, this is cool. This is cool. We can rap, man. Yeah, this is cool. Let's... We can get rap. I don't I know, man. Like, this all like the time. a whole lot of people, man, like <laughs> when it's white and black people talking, man, yeah. they go through a thing of, you know, not wanting to say this because they're afraid of somebody might misinterpret it. Well, you know, say something, you know, let me misinterpret it. And then, you know, when I run it back on you, yeah. then go ahead and tell me, man, don't do one of these things, man. Yeah. You know, I go to school, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I go to school, yeah. too, man. I live life. The people that are out there, you know, you say they're ignorant, people know a whole lot of what's going on, man. From from practical, just living, you did. They just I mean, they don't, maybe they don't know those terms and that book, you know, but they know what the deal is. You gotta show them something, man. You gotta show them something that you are for real. You gotta suffer, man. You just can't go out here and, and, and run your shit, man, and then, and then don't let no blood, and we bleeding every day. You know, you gotta bleed with us, man. We start bleeding together, and you say, wow, well, that cat hurting just like me, you know. So we gonna get behind this thing. We gonna ask that shit that's out there cutting us, you dig? Then you have it together. Then you gonna have it together. Yeah. You know, it ain't so simple, just being white or black. I don't, that's what we I gotta don't. realize we got the same enemy. We have the same enemy. And but when the one we thing, realize that, then we're gonna win. Okay, now, okay, now you said uh, you went into the service and you got the enemy because uh, you couldn't get into college, so you had to go in the army. Now, see, the reason we go in the army is for a different reason. Because, dig, of, now, dig, right? now we get out of high school, you dig, now we can't jump out there in the motherfucking street and go get a gig, man, because you black, you dig? Being black is a deep thing. I know you get yeah, tired I, I of hearing it, but it's some it. shit that is out there. Yeah, you dig? Know. I the only it. way that a, bro only way a, a brother enemy. can live when he get out of school, if he ain't got no smile, just to go in the army, man. Yeah, to go it. into the army. Man, we, don't, we only have one or two outlets to go, man. You got three or four, you did? Just like I was running that double standard thing on you, man. See, you got those variables. We don't. See, you can do that changing. Even if we decide to change to try to be a white person, we still be a nigga. We'd be one of Uncle Tom motherfuckers and still look down on you understand what I'm talking about? We ain't got nowhere to go, man. That's how come we so fucking desperate. Because we ain't got nowhere to go, man. That high visibility is going to keep you down all the time. So you can always change your mind, man. You can always go do what the rest of them is doing if you want that out there, what they're doing. You dig? I mean, you know, like I was, I was in there listening, man. Everybody was running about, yeah, this dude getting his ear cut off. You know, the atrocity thing. Everybody in there, man. That ain't that important. What the, it what ain't the important, point? man. You got to look at how come them people getting cut up and how come they're getting shot, man. That's the whole deal right there. Yeah. If you want to be for real, look at the reasons why. 
why, why? You know what, I do a thing every day. I watch television whenever I get the chance. I don't watch for entertainment, you know what I watch? I watch all the whitewashing they throw on you every day, man. Like uh, shit about Indians. Now they let the Indians win on television. For years, they didn't. Because there ain't enough of them to do nothing about right, it. Right, right. right but okay. now they're starting to see, wow, you know, we can't be doing this to the Indians, because the Indians trying to get their thing together. But now the Indians went on television. But for years, when you was a little kid, you sat there and sucked that shit up, didn't you? This is what you believed the real shot was until you became old enough to see it. it took you a long time, didn't it? Television still is like that. They're still after them little kids, man. Cartoons with the violence, you know, shooting bullets and shit and shoot them in the face, his face turned black, all this kind of shit. Even connotations, man, black people hate connotations like the difference between angel food cake and devil food cake. The black plague. It's the same shit. It's the same shit. The same shit. I didn't say, I didn't say fucking way. Yeah. 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 Chillin' here, here. Didn't do anything, didn't say anything about race. We were just no shit. No, it did. That. That's how come you ain't got no black people behind you. Because you forgot about racism, man. You forgot about that's how come you ain't got no black people down here? Yeah, okay, you got a few of us, and then they rap to you just like I do, man. Now, see, you're running a thing. You want to be human, man. You want to stop the war. You want to stop the killing the whole thing. But you still ain't talk, took time to learn how to treat your other brother cool. Can you dig it? You ain't saying nothing about him. And the brothers look at that, and they say, well, why, man? Why I want to go down there, man, and get involved? And shit ain't for me. It ain't for me. I, man, I just hope, man, just by standing here and rap with you now, if you didn't think about it before, think about it now. If you did think about it before, God damn it, now do something about the shit. It's not really your struggle. Um, there's an aura of hate in my outfit. I mean, a Vietnamese, there's no such thing to my unit as a friendly v uh, Vietnamese. Every Vietnamese is a gook. I've hardly ever heard the term Vietnamese. They were always gooks. There's no difference between a good one and a bad one, except the good one at the time is carrying no weapon, but he's still fair game. Uh, the games that some of the Marines in my outfit played, myself included, would be to find the older Papasans with the long whiskers, and which I guess is a symbol of his identity in their culture, and they would just be cut. They would brutalize anybody who complained. Uh, we would move into a village and we would just sit down we own the village while we're here. These people would do what we told them or they wouldn't be allowed to stay in their own house or they would be beaten inside the house. We were on our first operation and it was, it was an operation so it just followed this procedure. They were used to it and we were just shown how you destroy a village. And they just cried and carried on. We don't know what happened to them. That was the only village um, in the immediate vicinity so we cleared the area more or less. Everything is set on fire. My squad leader personally ignited the first two hooches and then just told us to take care of the rest. Uh, when we went out, I would say 50% at least of the villages we passed through would be burned to the ground. There was no difference between the ones we burned and the ones we didn't burn. It's just that some we had time and we'd burn them. We were given orders uh, whenever we moved into a village to reconnoiter by fire. This means to... Uh, Whenever we uh, step into a village, we're to fire upon uh, houses, bushes, anything to our discretion that look like there might be someone hiding behind, behind or in or under. Um, what, uh, what, what we did was we carry our rifles about hip high and we line up online and uh, parallel to the village and start walking, firing from the hip. Now, uh, there, there were times uh, when uh, Vietnamese villages uh, have uh, man-made uh, bomb shelters to protect themselves from uh, air raids. Well, sometimes when we come to a village, uh, there will, uh, a Vietnamese would run out of the bomb shelter, you know, for uh, fear of being caught. So consequently, uh, this surprise would startle any individual and they would automatically turn and fire, uh, thereby use, uh, uselessly killing civilians without giving them a chance. They give them an ambiguous order, like um, uh, some, some to the extent of, uh, or you're going into an area where there are known Viet Con, so that when you get there, anything that moves, you're going to fire at, you know. So, uh, so uh, uh, this is this is one of the mind tactical things that he he does to uh, to to make you want to you know attack somebody even though you know that you don't want to kill uh, another Vietnamese because you feel that he might be, in fact, your brother. I was a helicopter 
a Cobra gunship pilot. Uh, I worked with another aircraft at all times in what is called a hunter-killer team. I was told by the other pilots in the unit how to tell a VC from a civilian. Uh, if they were running, they were VC. If they were standing there, they were well-disciplined well disciplined VC, shoot them anyhow. Uh, they also told me that when we were flying over a village or near a village, uh, if people started to leave the village, civilians, uh, that was a good sign that there were VC in the area, that they were expecting a fight. While well, speaking with, a, with my hooch maid, she says, you know, when American helicopters come through, people run. They think they're going to be killed. So you put these two things together and you see, you know, civilians are in kind of a bad spot. As far as clearance to fire went, my first three months, I never heard of the term clearance to fire. If there is somebody that we thought might be VC by his actions, by running or hiding, he was a dead man. I've seen Hooch's CS to drive people out, and when the people were driven out and they're naturally running away, who wants to hang around and breathe a CS for an hour? They run out of the Hooch and they're killed. There's a large river that is to the west of Saigon, runs roughly north and south. I can't remember the name of it at the moment. But beyond this river, there is absolutely nothing left. There were hundreds and hundreds of villages marked on the maps that uh, I had with me. All kinds of names on the map. But you get over that area and there's nothing there at all. It's all been wiped out long ago. <clears throat> on the first operation that I was on, in country, we uh, went into a village called Five Fingers, and it was a typical cordon and search, which is you surround a village and then you sweep through it. And hopefully, when you're sweeping, if anybody's running from you, they're gonna run into the, of course, the surrounding troops on the other side and then they get wiped out. But we received fire as we walked into the village, and we took no casualties, but we did end up with a body count. Uh, no weapons were found, so apparently they were <coughs> civilians. The next day, uh, in the morning, should I say, they rounded up the entire village, all of them, and marched them out. You were all prisoners of war, all of them. Men, women, children made no difference. We filled two deuce and a halves. They were just relocated, man, just moved away. And were they allowed to take any of their belongings with them? Well, when you round them up, you round them up right now, and they don't go back for belongings because you don't know what they're going back for. At least that's the way my thinking was then. So when they left, they left with what they had on. In other words, all of their belongings were left in the village. Right, and then the destroyed. next day, like I say, we went through the village and tore everything apart. You know, tore w walls out of hooches, uh, just ripped everything apart looking for weapons or whatever. But we found nothing, and then they just, you know, set a torch to whatever you wanted to burn. Uh, 19 women and children were rounded up as Viet Cong suspects. And the lieutenant that rounded them up asked, called the captain on the radio, and he asked what should be done with them. The captain simply repeated the order that came down from the colonel that morning. The order that came down from the colonel that morning was to kill anything that moves, which you can take any way you want to take it. And um, when the captain told the lieutenant this, the lieutenant rang off. I got up. And I started walking over to the captain, thinking that the lieutenant just might do it because I'd served in his platoon for a long time. As I started over there, the captain, I think the captain panicked. He thought the lieutenant might do it too. And this was a little more uh, atrocious than the other executions that our company participated in, only because of the numbers. But the captain tried to call him up, tried to get him back on the horn, and it wouldn't, he couldn't get a hold of him. As I was walking over to him, I turned and I looked in the area. I looked to where the VCS were, supposed VCS. And two men were leading a young girl, approximately 19 years old, very pretty, out of a hooch. She had no clothes on. 
So I assumed she had been raped, which was pretty SOP. And uh, that's standard operating procedure for civilians. <laughs> and uh, she was thrown onto the pile of the 19 women and children, and five men around the circle opened up on full automatic with their M16s. And that was the end of that. Now, a lieutenant that was there, not the lieutenant that was there, there was a lieutenant who heard this over the radio in our company. He had stayed back with some mortars. He, when we got back to the, to our night location, he was going halfway out of his mind because he was, he had just gotten there relatively. Um, he was one of these, uh, I don't know, I guess he was naive or something. Believed in the old American ideal and, uh, he was going nuts. He was going to report it to everybody. And when he, that was, after that day, he calmed down. The next day, he didn't say anything about it. We got in a wretched firefight the next day. And the whole thing was just sort of lost in the intensity of the war. I would like to point out that if you uh, took the Vietnamese War, or the American War as it is, and uh, compared it right to the Indian Wars 100 years ago, it would be the same thing. All the massacres were the same, and... Uh, Nowadays, they use chemical warfare. Back then, uh, they put smallpox in the blankets and gave them to the Indians. And uh, you could uh, just go right down the line and name them off, and they would be the same thing. When I was small, I was exposed to this, and I kept growing, and I kept growing and learning. But it was so much that when I watched TV or something and watched the Indian in the Calvary, I would cheer for the Calvary. That's how bad it was. And uh, you can take any culture, any culture of these people up here on a, on a panel, any culture out there, and if you look back into it deep, they had something good. Way back they had it. And uh, and then people started getting onto the uh, the money bag, and that's when it all happened. Uh, like, uh, the, well, we made treaties long ago. It was for as long as the grass shall grow and as long as the river shall flow. The way things are going now, one of these days, the grass isn't going to grow. And the river isn't going to flow. your head that something was really wrong? Well, when I came back from Nam, I had, there were the draftees in my unit. And uh, they thought all different than the way everyone else thought. And I talked with them because I like talking with people. And they told me why they thought the war was wrong and why we shouldn't go there and why evading the draft isn't wrong. And uh, it took, I thought about it, you know, but I didn't really think it was right. And then I got into college. I started taking history courses because I'm a pre-law major. I had to take a lot of political science and history, and uh, I started seeing things, and I couldn't believe things were, you know, like the book said, like uh, the Geneva Convention. And it's okay that we didn't allow free elections, because if they would have had free elections, they would have been communists, and we couldn't let that happen, so it's okay. You know, and I just, I couldn't buy that kind of stuff. And it really started turning me. And I, I started thinking about everything in my past experiences and relating them to what I was learning. And thinking about what we were really doing in Nam. You know, we weren't uh, benefiting the people. The only thing we're doing over there is uh, uh, for our own economic gains and uh, political power. It's uh, like the balance of power. We're being that close to China, you know, gives us a little bit more power on the scale. And the country wants as much as it does, it can have. And uh, we don't care about the people. And uh, if they were somewhere else, we wouldn't, like Czechoslovakia, we wouldn't interfere. So all the experiences all of a sudden just start rushing back at this point? Right, and I decided that all the things I did really wasn't right, and that I should think of people as 
human beings, not as black or white or, uh, uh, or red, or even what, the, what their uh, philosophies were. And sometimes when I talk about it, you know, I laugh all the time, you know, because I don't want people to think that I'm, I'm not a man and it's kind of a, the way I've been brought up again, you know, you're supposed to be a man and men are hard and they don't have feelings and stuff. But uh, when, I, when I think about it, it bothers me inside. And I, and I, like, I know there's nothing I can do to, to change it, so, you know, why let it bother me so I don't think about it? Has your concept of what a man is changed? Uh, yes. I don't, I don't anymore. But even though I don't, like, I had some sensitivity courses, and it got where, you know, sometimes guys would cry. And, uh, you know, like, sometimes I felt like crying. Like, we'd really see a sensitive film and get into something really deep. But I'd start to, and I'd think about something else. So, like, even though I know I shouldn't think of a man the way it is, I just, you know, can't change. I, I try to change, but I still, you know, try to be uh, brave and things like that, rather than and hard and emotionless. Do you want to change? Uh, I think if I really wanted to change, I could. Yeah, I'm just afraid that I'm not, I'm not really sure what I want. But it's very hard, you know, to, to, to something that you really have faith in, like a society, and to lose faith in it. And it's, uh, it puts your head through some changes when you, when you keep seeing things that look wrong and more things that look wrong and less things that look right, and you don't think you're really wrong. But then when you're talking to your family or someone trying to find out, really, and show them why you think the way you do, and like they all say, you're crazy, you know, I don't, how can you think like that? Then it upsets you, and then you go back to school and uh, you talk to people and they understand. I went up to the University of Western Carolina and to speak on it because when I do, it makes me feel better, you know, and I want other people to see, you know, what's going on. But uh, when I went up there and I showed it, they kind of put me on the spot and uh, like they asked, this woman asked me a question. She said, aren't you ashamed of what you did? And uh, does it make you feel bad that we're hostile towards you because of what you did? And it really made me feel bad. But I, so I reacted and I said, uh, I blamed it on her. I asked her how old she was and she said she was 37. And I told her that I was 19 when I went to Vietnam and it was her, her fault because she was a crummy voter that I got sent there. And it was her fault that I had to go through all that shit. So I should be mad at her and she shouldn't be ma mad at me. But it did upset me that when I try to talk to people that they try to put you on the spot about it. And I'd like to let them know what's going on, but without being on the spot, because I'm still, it bothers me sometimes. But do you realize how hard it is, like, uh, even, even when you tell them what it's like for people to understand, you know? No, I, I can't, you know, I guess I should be able to, and I never thought about it until you just said it. But uh, I imagine it is hard for them. It, I can't perceive it being hard for me because I, I did it, you know, I, ex I experienced it, and it's hard to, you know, experience something, not know how other people can't do it. Scott, was it difficult for you to give testimony? Very difficult, very difficult. And uh, I, I really wouldn't have done it if Mark Lennox hadn't showed up. But I realized it was very important because he and I had been lieutenants together. And uh, I realized it was very important to, you know, to give testimony with him so we could corroborate our testimony. But uh, had he come, I don't think I would have given it. And uh, I don't know why. Because all the other guys have gone through the same thing. But uh, when I was on the stage there, I was like really uptight. And I was trying to, I put myself in a mood where I'd be very, very cold and all that sort of thing because I realized that I'd probably start crying if I, you know. And uh, I don't know, maybe it's... Why were you afraid to, um, to start crying? Because I'm still imbued with that, all that shit that I was fed. It hasn't gotten all out of my system. <laughs> That's right. It really has. It takes a long time. And uh, it's just a matter of dealing with it in terms of, you know, realizing it. And it, it won't come all at once. It comes gradually. And, uh, you know, hopefully someday it'll be gone. But, uh... You know, it's still there, and, uh, you know, I, I accept it, and I, I realize it. I think especially this weekend, you know, I, I saw a lot of guys who were in the same bag, man, and uh, that's important, you know, safety in numbers, I guess. And, um, but, you know, it'll come, and it's just a matter of, you know, realizing, and that you have to realize what, fully, what, in fact, you've been um, 
and taught. Scott was like I was. We were, we were in the army, and we were the army. You know, that's the whole thing, and that's what's so scary. That's why it was so good to see Scott now and see that he was really a human being again instead of being a soldier. You know, because now Scott has wants and needs and desires, and before, you know, you just sort of was just, you know, all rap, and maybe it'll happen one day, man. Well, now I can see that things are starting to happen. And for both Scott and for myself. Because we were, it was strange, because we were definitely soldiers to the end. That's, that's what's so strange about it. That, that the indoctrination, the training, and things you have just ma are make you that way. And then when you see that you were that way, that you were living a lie, you know, you weren't living your life, you were just living, I don't know, it's almost like a road map that someone had laid out in front of you. And, you know, they knew where you were going just by the way they would indoctrinate you. And then all of a sudden, it's, whew, it's wrong. And once you realize it's wrong, you got it licked. But the point is, you have to bring it out, you have to confront it openly, you know, with yourself. And find out where your priorities lie. And then you have to either live them or deny them and then be plastic forever. You know, it's up to you. When I first entered the service, I thought, uh, well, sure, I'll, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I will be a hero and just think of this, I'll have a rock hard body and golly. Because you'll have, when I, when I went into the service, that's where my head was at. You know, I was the average middle class American. You know, it was just the thing to do. And they dehumanize you so much that the enemy is no longer a human being who has a wife and a child. Or, you know, has a family life. He just becomes the enemy. And therefore, when you're confronted with this, all you think of is it's just like another target. And they've trained you to shoot targets. So when it comes right down to it, and there it is, it's not a man. It's a target. And then you, when you start to realize it, my God. Look at this, you know, I've been, this can't be me, man, after all this time. You know, I know that I shouldn't be doing this, but, well, here I am. And I had been trying to justify them for, you know, this period of time, because I knew it wasn't right, but I had to justify it some way, because I was doing it. Then all of a sudden I realized, no, there is no justification, man. What I have done is wrong. I have to face it. I have to admit that what I have done is wrong. And now I have to try and tell other people before they make the same mistakes I made. <laughs> I walk down to the dry bar. You know I should go soldiers and I walk down to the dry bar. You know I should go soldiers and God, he put his arm around my shoulder. Said he's gonna be an army man. Yeah, my brother's out fighting. Did I know down Vietnam? My brother's out fighting. Did I know down Vietnam? But he don't understand why they never 